and welcome to episode 126 of Random Encounter, the RPG Fan Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Stein, and Pale Robbie on the boards. Joining me today is Derek. I wish Morgana was a ferret Heemsbergen. That is so true. That might be one of my most favorite nicknames you've ever given me. I, I, but I wish, like, every small animal was a ferret, basically. Nothing against all other types of small animals, but damn, ferrets Ferrets are the top. I, I think Morgana needs to get a special prize this year as the least annoying anime trope character in a Persona game ever, because I absolutely adore him slash except, her. Right, me too. I also <laughs> adore Morgana, except for the fact that Morgana will not let me decide when I want to go to bed. Oh god, god that is god the worst! <laughs> oh, as as, uh, and, as and Twitter normally... user Voodoo Person said, uh, Morgana is uh, the exter- it's an external- blah, externalized avatar of your depression. Yep. <laughs> That's that strange. was, and that's strange because, in my experience, cats are usually trying to wake you up in the middle of the night to play instead of forcing <laughs> you to go to sleep. Yeah, this is not right. This is, this is counter cat culture. Uh, okay, so we got two other people to get in here. We have uh, Robert. I wish it was darker, Fenner. Well, you know, I don't know <laughs> if that's entirely fair. Um, I'm actually, you know, I'm actually really, really feeling this. Um, I'm, I thought you might. I thought you I'm, might. Much happier with this than I was with SMT4 Apocalypse. So, oh so come on, the, the power of friendship beating demons. But I, I think P5 is more appropriate here. Yeah, I think P5 is a lot darker than people were expecting. It, it's got a, it's got more of an edge, kind of the way that Persona 3 did. Whereas Persona 4 was like Scooby and the gang, you know, solving mysteries, which I love. Like, don't I'm not bashing it, but this kind of feels like a little bit of a return to the the darkness of Persona a little bit. It's kind of a step between 3 and 4, I'd say. Yeah, I think that's fair. It's also red. It's very red. And then <laughs> we have uh, Mike, my cosmic star heroine, Solosi. Okay, one moment. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to say anything about that. But now you have me thinking, is... is, is uh, would you say that Teddy's more like a Scrappy Doo and Morgana's more like a Scooby Doo in terms of how in, in terms of how uh, appropriate the mascot Teddy is? That much. I don't. Yeah, yeah I don't. Fair. That's I fair. don't detest Teddy, but I did not like him. Whereas Morgana, from like the opening scene, I was like, okay, you are yeah. my cat. Maybe it's because I'm a cat person, and I'm mostly playing Persona Five with one of my cats like on my lap the entire time. And you play Persona Five most of Persona Five with a cat in your backpack or in your party. Yeah, and and I love how like he like uh I, I'm gonna say he again I I'm not far enough in the game to use proper pronouns but they refer to him as a he, uh but he like will put his head up whenever I answer a question in class and then as the screen's fading out he puts his head down like I, there's just little touches like that that just make hanging me really out really happy. Yeah, he's just hanging out at your desk. And Morgana yeah. does say I'm obviously male when they ask him directly at yes. one point. Yes. Yes. Um, Voiced by a female, but whatever. Uh, Goku is voiced by a female in Japan, so I'll, I'll get yeah. over. It. Yeah, okay. yeah. This, um, and uh, in Japan, Morgan Morgana's voice actress is the same voice as- actress as Pikachu. So lovely, ex- extra squeaky. Okay, uh, so we got to talk about Persona Five. It is finally here. I apologize to our listeners for taking so long. I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to to really dig into this, you know, one hundred freaking hour RPG. I've only put in about twenty. I'm on to the third palace, uh, so I, I'm sure I'm behind all of y'all. Uh, we're obviously going to avoid spoilers. I want to throw that out there right now. We're going to talk in generalities uh, about the game, the systems. We will talk a little bit about the localization. So I. I'll give you a warning when that happens, and I'll try to include some some times in the show notes in case you really don't want to hear anything. And then we do have to talk about something that skeeves me out a little bit related to a couple of the uh, social links in the game. And again, I'll put a, a timestamp on that to let you know when we start and end that talk in case you really don't want to listen to it. But uh, I, I know they're called confidence confidants now, but I'm going to still call them social links forever probably. Yeah, I'm going to call them by that, their proper Christian name. They are <laughs> social links. Like, that, that, that term is ensconced in my brain now. So what do we think here, guys? I'm kind of – I guess for me it was like the first – First hour or so of playing this game was just like a visual overload of just this might be the, one of the most beautiful games and one of the most stylish games I've ever played. The music mm. has just wrapped me up in a blanket of pure comfort, and I will actually play it in my office constantly when when like kids are working on problems, just as like smooth jazz music in the background. Uh, I am just in love with this game, but I, I will say it is like almost intimidating how much there is to it, and I, I kind of have to feel like enough energy to sit down and play this game of like, okay, I'm really going to get into this, I'm going to do some dungeon crawling, I'm going to talk to some people, like, whew, it's an investment. 
It's no doubt, uh, like you said, I think it's one of, if not the most stylish video game ever made. I know that's very, very lofty praise, but when every single facet of the entire experience oozes as much charisma as this game does, it's hard to, it's almost hard to go back to other games, which doesn't mean that, you know, like, it's, uh, that other games are going to fall short forever. But yeah, I mean, like, when you have a menu that is as compelling as Persona 5's, you know, it's like, I, I've had uh, two instances of people coming over to my house for whatever reason, and then they're like, all right, we're going to go out or, you know, we'll make dinner or something. And then I'm playing Persona 5, and they just sit on the couch, and they're enraptured. Yeah. And these are people who have never played a Persona game before. Or, and both of them actually don't even really play RPGs. And they just sat there like, oh, my God, what is this game? Like, why is everything so cool? Uh, <laughs> Even, even the, like the victory menu, menu where you're just sort of like you, you just you just transition into into running into the uh, into just continue running into the dungeon, everything from the UI to the uh, to the combat to just transitioning from phase to phase is so stylish and good. I I'm just the whole thing is just a feast for the eyes and ears. I I have not been this pumped about a game in maybe a decade. I'm. I really love the loading screens. You know, like you keep c- commuting to school in the morning and oh, you yeah, know, see the, yeah. the passengers and, uh, and, and the, the spin- train. The spinning umbrellas if you walk from a place to place in the rain. That's right. Um, <laughs> and then like you you go on a field trip and the people walking around in the loading screen change to reflect where you are. Yes. Is That's anybody cool. playing on PS3 or are we all PS4? PS4. PS4. Yeah. PS4 here. I bought a PS4 earlier this year with this game as a major motivating factor. I just I, I was just interested to see how it played on PS3. I haven't heard anything bad uh, at all. I mean, about development like PS11. So, yeah. I've I've heard that it's pretty much the same. Answer. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It's not. Uh, I mean, it's it's incredibly stylish, but it's not uh, the most I guess taxing on the hardware. Right. I, th- right. I think I heard the loading times were a little longer, but not even that much. Mm. It's also very impressive going back to the UI for a second. Like, I, I'm, I'm not bagging on Final Fantasy 15. Please don't take it that way. I'm, I want to finish this game, but like, Final Fantasy 15's menus are atrocious. Like, it is difficult to read if you are any sort of distance away from the TV in your living room. At least they're releasing a patch to let you UI scale it. Thank Christ. But like. Mm-hmm. By comparison, where I feel like I am constantly just battling with menus in Final Fantasy XV to get places, Persona 5, just with the ability to, just with one touch of, what is it, the square button, to instantly heal your whole party, very easily bringing up menus. The fact that they've incorporated the entire PlayStation 4, uh, like all the button prompts, you can easily get to your Persona. You can easily attack people. You're not cycling through uh, menus. Remember in Persona 3, it was always a question of, like, when I press down, does that mean the wheel clo- rotates clockwise or counterclockwise? Like, mm. I don't think anybody can tell me which way it actually says with, like, 100% certainty but like this game has just been designed around slick user user interface and we kind of knew they were going to do that after smt4 and uh smt4 apocalypse on the ds they just these guys 3ds these guys really know how to build a ui that is just sexy as all hell and gives you all the functional information very quickly Mm -hmm. there's something Mm -hmm. to be said about being able to execute a command with only one button prompt that makes it, it's just so it's comfortable. It's easy Mm -hmm. to play and and you get into a battle and it's like, you can do auto comp, you know, a rush like auto battle if you want, or if you know that you want all your characters to defend a turn, it's like, you know, circle, confirm, circle, confirm, circle, confirm, instead of having to scroll through the list of commands, which is, you know, something that I can still handle, but it's when, when you're handed the option to play it, like persona four lets you play it. It's like, damn, (laughs) Why aren't all the other games doing this, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, t- it took a little getting used to because I'm, I mean, I'm very comfortable menu scrolling for and navigating menus in RPGs just because I've been doing it for decades. But it's so fast and easy in Persona 5 that it's going to be hard to go back and replay any of the other games in the series. Am I the only one that really hopes that they take this demon negotiation and put it into whatever SMT5 is? Like, because it actually oh. makes sense, and it, it's not nearly as obnoxiously obtuse of, like, I like jelly beans, so do I. I will kill you for loving jelly beans. Like, I, it, maybe it's a little too simple in this game, but the demon negotiation is really cool, and you're actually fighting demons in this game, which makes me think that they are just going to do what Atlas did in the PlayStation 2 era and just reuse all these assets and make a proper oh, Shin Megami Tensei yeah. 5. That is really nice. So, 
It's going to be so gorgeous. I, I think they're going to fold these assets and this engine into more PS4 era RPGs, one of which I t- I'm totally okay with. And it's yeah, it's a better version of Persona 2 Negotiation, which is great. I, I haven't played any of the SMT games that have a lot of negotiation in them other than Strange Journey, which is yeah. its own weird thing. It's it's really not like Persona 2s at all. That Persona 2s was really well, yeah, no, too complicated right. and cumbersome. This is a lot, lot, quite a bit similar to SMT4, I'd say. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. yeah. It's it, and SMT4 was definitely way better. And and allowing you to carry over skills when you fuse personas that that has been like I think the key to bringing the Shin Megami Tensei series to like almost AAA status. It's probably there right now, but like. That takes away a lot of the guessing game that existed with uh, with Shimagami Tensei Nocturne to the yeah. point where, like, even if you pick the same demons over and over again for fusion, you would get different combinations of abilities and how crappy that was. This game eliminates all that. Like, hey, you can have you know a uh, a Jack Frost that has an Agi skill, uh, a fire skill, just to make sure that you're bringing that over to whatever your next fusion is going to be. I really adore that. Uh, it's it's super streamlined. I think that uh, not just innovation, but um, sort of convenience is a key a tenet of of the Persona design philosophy at this point. Because we went from even Persona Three, not I mean it, the original Persona Three didn't have fast travel. No, and it didn't. A, a big yeah. reason why Persona Three Portable was so much easier to play, even though it removed the sort of field areas outside of Tartarus, I found it a lot more enjoyable because. It's a lot of fun to explore these environments, but when you're doing it for the 10th, 20th, 30th, you know, 100th time, you don't want to have to run across the map every single time. So I, I love that they've really taken into account each of those small improvements and how they affect the overall experience, and they've implemented those into pretty much every game going forward. Mm-hmm. So I could see a lot of these things from Persona 5 that are super convenient being carried over. I don't remember, did Persona 4 have like an uh, instant heal all party button? I don't think so. I don't think it did. I mean, that's not like, you know, you can do without it, right? But once you have it, you're like, okay, cool. I love this. I want this always. No, I don't think they did, but they did have the uh, the fox that let, allowed you to pay to heal in the middle of the dungeon. So um, right. SP is more of a lit- limiting resource in Persona 5 than it was in Persona 4. But, mm. uh, Which I'm cool with. I, yeah, I, no, I but that, that's just a exciting... Yeah, the, 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 dun- the dungeon flow is just different between the two games. It is. Mm-hmm. I, I would uh, so I I do have a couple complaints about the game. Um, it, it took me a real long time to get used to the flow of uh like infiltrating these palaces and using cover. I, I think the game's camera can be very unwieldy uh, unwieldy at times, and it does kind of have the the Final Fantasy 15 problem of like walking up to a wall and thinking that you got the prompt to like go into cover and you just didn't press it right, and so then you're just kind of standing there. So there, there's a little mm-hmm. bit of awkwardness. It's it's a little, not terrible, but like I was kind of surprised because I, I honestly felt like the cover just worked almost all the time. Like there are some some surfaces that you can't go into cover against. But I felt like I got the hang of it very quickly, and it felt very smooth traversing palaces. Like, there are some objects that, uh, I can't really think of a specific example. We'll say, like, Palace 2, maybe. I think there are, like, some art pieces or something that might be, if I'm remembering correctly, they had, like, they're very small. So when you dive out of cover to another one, you could sometimes get on the wrong side, like, not the one you wanted. And it's kind of awkward to maneuver around those. Um, but overall, I, like I think it adds a lot of fluidity to traversal, which is not something that Persona Three and Four had at all. And, and th- there, there's also like a huge element of they really play into the theme of you being a thief, and everything when you're in the palaces revolves around you being a thief, using cover, staying out of sight. If you're seen too too often, you'll get thrown out of the dungeon. So there, there's a little bit of st- you know basic stealth mechanics at play. You're making lock picks at night to get into chests they have leaned into a theme that we really haven't seen before with a traditional jrpg of you're a thief and and this game makes me feel more like a thief than that god-awful thief game that came out a few years ago that was just <laughs> they, yeah, they, they they really ride the thief gimmick hard because i mean every uh every persona for the main characters is a historical or uh or literary thief or um or you know mm. 
ne'er or ne'er do well, and then when they and then when they upgrade their personas, they're all mythological tricksters, and they and every dungeon feels like a heist. Every um, they, there's the whole Inception angle of you know, going into going into someone's soul to change it. It's it, it they they the thief gimmick is I think really successful and stylish and serves the game uh, that serves the larger game itself. I I really really dig it, and I and I was a little uh, going in I wasn't really sure how successful it would be when we saw the when we saw the the first Phantom Thief trailers for this. Like it, it looked cool, but I really didn't know how they would pull it off, and they totally pull it off. I it's it's so much fun, even down to the weird. Costumes that they each have. It's it's my, what are you, not since Locke's section in Final Fantasy VI have I felt like such a competent thief. Wouldn't have been cool if you could actually like one somebody's persona was Locke. How awesome <laughs> would that have been? Yeah, <laughs> or if Zorro or, or if Zorro upgraded to Batman. That, oh, that you know what? That would have been excellent. Is a I, I've beaten the game. I, I finished with about 95 hours in the clock. Holy and, crap, Derek. <laughs> yeah, very rarely. First of all, I went way too damn hard. Like, I know I <laughs> like, really did you uh, did you do the thing where, like, you played it so much that then you started to question whether or not you really liked it? Because that happens to me every once no, in a while. No, no, no. I, I liked it the whole time. Uh, it's lucky that I'm I'm looking for full-time work right now, so I had uh, free time to spare. But um, yeah, I, I beat it, and I almost immediately was like, "Is it time to play it again?" <laughs> Which never happened. <laughs> like the only time that ever really happens to me is occasionally with maybe uh, an East game because I like to play those at harder difficulties, which is also not something that I usually do. But also, but, an East game is like fifteen or twenty hours, and this game is ninety plus hours. I know, so right. I, was like, I don't know if I can commit to another playthrough yet. But of course, they have a lot of convenient new game plus features, like carrying over your social stats and other things. And uh, I'm just kind of waiting for. As much as I don't really want to pay for it, uh, I'm waiting for a DLC costume set I really want to drop so that I can like buy that and play again with that. I think I want the Catherine one. I think that one comes in about uh, in like the first week of May because we, we've already had we've already had the P3 and P4 ones and then the P1 and P2 ones. Mm-hmm. So I think I think this week is like the arena and dancing all night ones, and then the following week is the Catherine stuff. I think. I, I think Rido is coming out between. Oh yeah, I want that one too. I oh, love. And, and there's also an if as well. What's that? Is there an if set as well? I think there is. Yeah, no, no. The, I think the if set is already out. That came out at oh, the same time really? as the P1, P2 ones. It, it's funny. But, yeah, that there, <laughs> there's over a hundred, a uh, hundred dollars worth of DLC here. It's crazy. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get there. Oh we're gonna get there in a second. Uh, I I. I find it interesting that you wanted to fire it up right again, Derek, because with uh, with both P3 and P4, when I finished them, I thought I was really going to want to replay them. And then as soon as I started getting the, to the tutorials again and, like, oh, I have to go through, like, talking to Yosuke and, like, learning about going into the Midnight Channel, I was like, mm, no. Well, like, I mean, this does have a fast-forward feature, though. That is true. And it, it also th- – this one, I think, starts far stronger than P4. Like, it, it gets oh, you – it gets you into the action way faster. Yep. So it's – I really like it. Uh, Derek, I do want to ask you since you finished it, and without spoiling story, of course, I, I kind of read ahead to see what people were complaining about, that the game apparently just throws a very big dungeon at you at the end that's a little monotonous. Can you – I'm, I'm having flashbacks to Apocalypse right now. Is, is it really going to make me cry? Or is oh, it's it like, not. It's not, not bad, that right? bad. It's not bad. Yeah, there's. Um, uh, I want to say Persona is. I don't want to say it's predictable because it's it's still exciting. But after Persona Four, especially, I feel like now they've kind of fallen into this trap of we have to have X and Y twist, and then yeah. we have to give you the you think it's over, but it's not, and then a second you think it's over, but it's not, and Persona Five does that. I, I still liked it all the way through, but it was kind of like, okay, I knew that was going to happen. Okay. There there were elements that still totally took me by surprise, but the overall sort of trajectory, I think I saw coming from way far away. Um, I was and afraid it does... of that happening. I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I think I'm in, the, I'm in the seventh dungeon, so I was like, oh boy, I bet they're going to throw something at me, aren't they? They yeah. do, they do, oh, do oh that. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm, in, the... I'm in between Robert and Derek. I just finished the seventh dungeon, and I'm setting up the finale right now. Okay, I think the 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 final dungeon is a little uninspired, but it doesn't go on that long. 
Okay. 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 So it, it is not the teleporter uh, death trap. No, there, there are no teleporters. Oh, the the God. longest dungeon is by far the like the the one the game sort of sets up to be the final dungeon. Mm-hmm. So the, like, the, if, the, the one with the December deadline. Uh yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm kind that of doing that far. so far. So. It's it's long, but I actually liked that one a lot. I, it has I, a really I, really good music track too. Yeah, mm. I like most of the dungeons in this game, and um, they only really become grueling if I try to do one in a single in-game day. Because yeah. then, because then by the end, I'm, all of my characters are running out of SP. It's you know I I can't do every encounter anymore, be, and mm. I have to do a lot of uh, enemy dodging. Like I remember in particular the third and fourth dungeons being just a little bit. A little bit tricky getting to the very end. Oh, good. Uh, That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, in, in a, it, uh, in a single day. But the thing is, it's it's very possible to spread out the dungeon crashing over multiple days, and then you won't ha- run into into as many problems that way. But I I really wanted to try and get them done in one or two days if possible, which yeah. was not always easy. I did but, not. I, I really didn't like the boss of the second dungeon. Um, kind of relying that's on. That's exciting. Uh, he was just more obnoxious. Like it, that boss fight went on for like a half hour, and there was like a point in the middle of it where I nearly got wiped, and I was kind of having that feeling like if I get wiped out in a half an hour turn-based fight, I might not come back to this game for a while. Like that just, I don't know. That I, I think that every once in a while, SMT games can rely a little too heavily on just like something bad could happen, you know? And I think Persona's done a really good job of getting away from that. But, like, they they took a step back with this game where, like, if the main character dies, that's it. And that that was, like, jarring for me when it happened in a in a random battle at one point. Yeah. I had the wrong weakness, and I got blasted once, then I got blasted again, and I died in two hits. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, main character fell. Okay, everything... Wait, what? What? Back game? to the title screen. <laughs> what? Like, that felt like a huge step back. Like, even SMT4 didn't do that. And that's what kind of world are we living in where you can restart quicker and with less penalties in SMT4 than you can in Persona 5? <laughs> yeah, that was a little weird. That that was for, a little weird. For boss battles, they let you start at the beginning of the fight. That's true. That's, yeah, that's, um, and, that's and, uh, and later in the game, all of your party members, including your navigator, can do uh, can stop death blows to the main character with, with, if you invest enough into their social link. Okay. Which is... Um, yeah, once you get that, then then you're a lot safer. Yeah. Okay. It, it's only happened once, but it was bizarre. I'm like, wait a minute, SMT4 is, to me supposed too. To, SMT4 is supposed to be the hardest nails game. Like, why the hell did P5 just kick me in the nuts that hard? One, like, I, I, the only boss that I that really gave me real trouble was one of the Mementos bosses, which uh, had a uh, in the middle of the game. I think I fought it during the summer sometime, and it um it. it it, it was it was able to throw an annoying status effect on all of my characters and then attack with psychic skills that got bonus damage from that status effect. So it, it I, I wiped three or four times against it uh, and uh, and you know was lucky enough just to have the status effect miss a couple times to to beat it. But um the and uh, the one other boss fight that's uh the one in the uh, in the December dungeon that that guy has like has five forms or something. So he that was a little trying. But other than that, I haven't noticed any major, uh, any real difficulty problems, but I'm playing on normal. Yeah, and I'm playing on normal too. I think it's just, you can run into a problem where because the main character can use different personas, you might just have the wrong persona equipped at the wrong time. Uh, yeah. you, you don't get the jump on an enemy, and then you just get blasted. And like, that's, that, that's SMT. Like, I'm not going to complain too much about it, but going from Apocalypse where even if you died, Dagda would just bring you right back and just be like, okay, you know, dust you off a little bit. All right, try again, which I think is the right form of difficulty for the SMT yeah. games. We're, we're talking about games where you can get blown up in one move. Like, mm-hmm. being able to I just I think the back to the loading off. screen is it's far too harsh, because I mean, sometimes, you know, some of these save points are half an hour or more um, in each other. It's a few frustrating moments where, you know, I'd get ambushed, and that was it, and I lost maybe half an hour or an hour's progress. I was like, right, I think I'm done for tonight. And it's the kind yeah. of thing, like, if, if they're going to punish you by wasting your time penalty, that's really archaic and, and not good for 2017. 
Yeah, it's it's the only part of the game that I felt like was a little bit of a step backwards. I mean, granted, I'm I'm also coming off playing uh, P3 Portable, where I got to control my entire party, and I had to be reminded of like, well, remember when you first played Persona 3, you couldn't control the entire party. And <laughs> That's I'm like, right. Oh. And then, in, in, <laughs> even the the Fest remake didn't have that ability. Oh God, that oh, I, there were just moments of like, why aren't you healing me? Help, please! Haven't I been nice to you? I'm taking you out for chocolate parfaits like 50 times. What the hell? Having to talk. Uh, to Having to talk to your party members individually and go through like all these different menus and button presses just to like give them an item to equip. Yeah. Oh, Those that's right. The days. Yeah, there wasn't even a, a common menu where you could equip yep. your team. You had to. T- right. Oh, that was awful. That was really bad. <laughs> it, it's definitely a lot better in that respect. So I, th- I think overall we're all we're all very high on P5. Can we can we talk? You know, we we love our children, and uh, I think that means we can also criticize a little bit. Uh, and I think we've done a little bit of that. Two major areas of criticism here, and and I think the first is not spoiler related, so I will not put the spoiler tag right here. But um, is Atlas getting away with murder when it comes to DLC? I know I've said this before, but I I I kind of feel like they're getting a free pass, where like they're they're doing the horse armor thing and no one's calling them on it. Well, I mean, it's not like plot essential stuff. It's all these little bonuses. Um, I don't know. I guess I, people criticize Bandai Namco, don't they? So yeah, I've I've already yeah. Spent, uh, I've spent twenty one dollars on this DLC so far, but it's uh, which is you know a third of the cost of the game already. But um, I I have to say I'm I think it's fun at least because the uh, using the Persona Four DLC as an example, it gives you a costume for all nine of the playable characters. It gives you a uh, glasses accessory that boosts experience for whatever for any character that equips it. And if you have the main character equipped in the Persona Four outfit, it changes the uh, battle music and victory music to the uh, Persona Four Golden stuff. And so yeah. all of I that was, was seven bucks. I appreciate that these are sold as bundles because if each costume was sold individually i would want to tear my hair out because that's exactly what oh god yeah that, that, that's 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 tails stuff better. yeah mm-hmm. not to mention tails stuff yeah <laughs> in tails yeah. that's uh it's more expensive too it's like isn't it like three bucks a costume or some of these packs so, are like yeah. 12 13 bucks for for tails games oh and and also um the in persona 5 they haven't re- they have the schedule out but they haven't released all the dlc yet the uh, the casual the casual clothes the maid butler set and the swimsuit set are being released for free. Oh, and the Christmas yeah. the Christmas yeah, set I, too. I think I'm also a little maybe I'm a little bit paranoid too because when I was in the throes of Shin Megami Tensei Four Apocalypse like hate and I was just getting completely torn apart by the last boss of that game and could not beat it until I lowered the difficulty. Every YouTube video that I watched online, people were using like the ultimate demons that you only got through the paid DLC, Put and I was like, I, I was like, that's pretty <laughs> gross, like that. And I don't yeah, think that's you know, there there are a couple of downloadable personas for this game, which I haven't gotten any of. Have you bought any of those, Solosi? No, I've only bought three custom sets. Okay, because I'm, I'm kind of right? wondering, they... what's that? Aren't they cameos of like other main characters? Yeah, 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 like, it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah exactly. Or uh, Izanagi, those, and and I think the levels are range from the 40s to 60s. None of them seem, you know, end it's, like end like end game. None of them are end game. Okay, I was kind of curious about that, um, just because I wonder if you got those, if they would kind of help you speed through early game, or like, because I don't even know if if you buy them, do you have to be a high enough level to summon them? Like, no, uh, they you can summon them once without without a level penalty or without paying yen. But if you summon them, but beyond the first summon, yet you, you have to pay yen, just like they, just like normal stuff like in your compendium. Your compendium, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's. I mean, as long as they don't break game balance, that's fine, and they are just sort of cameo personas. That doesn't bother me so much. Um, nor do the costumes being. I, you know, I, I am okay with cosmetic DLC sometimes. Like I bought, um, like a. a I'll buy things for Final Fantasy fourteen sometimes for my character, like glamour items that don't affect anything other than how you look. Like, like that's fine, as long as it doesn't become too egregious, and that's where it's kind of difficult to draw the line, because as a consumer, if I'm sending them the message that I'm okay with purchasing this for real money, you know, <laughs> they they could just take that and run with it and say, like, okay, well, they're happy to pay for it, so let's jack up the prices, let's split all these into separate items. Like, that's not what I want, so... Eh, as long as it doesn't become too egregious, it's fine. It's just hard to say. You know, how, how do I communicate that to the to the developers without directly sending them feedback on it? 
Right. Um, I, I think these price points could be interpreted as a little high or too high. I, I have also bought costume DLC mostly for uh, Heroes of the Storm and Street Fighter IV. I've uh, dropped money on both of those for costumes. But I, I don't think this is that bad, especially since they're bu- they're in bu- – like you said before, they're in bundles and not individually like Band Dynamco stuff. It would be gra- game-breaking to buy some of these level 60 personas and play the very beginning of the game with them. But it doesn't look like it would break the end game. And it, it, it's mostly aesthetics. Like it's um the reason you download one of these isn't to break the game. It's so that you can use Izanagi in Persona Five, so yeah. which I think is is fine. And the the price points are maybe a little high. Like seven dollars for costume DLC just feels high, even though you're getting seven, uh, nine costumes yeah. and uh, it comes with and the music audio and tracks. Like yeah. the, the audio is for me, audio is almost the bigger thing because when you're playing a ninety hour oh, yeah. game. <laughs> you want to be able to switch up the audio. I mean, I guess you could do a custom soundtrack or whatever, but I do like the ability to have the uh, the older DLC. And all I can say is thank God that none of this is being sold as the hot springs pack. Get only yeah. the <laughs> like, That's true. I just, yeah. I, again, I just, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where I, I think a lot of other companies get raked across the coals for it, justifiably so. And maybe Apocalypse was a an outlier and they've learned their mistakes from that. But it is one of those things where it's like, I'm watching you Atlas. Yeah. You worry that they might be getting a free pass because of the quality of the rest of the game. Right. And I I don't think this is disgusting, but if the Um, trend escalates, it could be worrying. Let's, let's also keep in mind that these companies who are being raked over the coals, they're putting out games and, and, we are very, very rarely seeing SMT nowadays. They're definitely not annual like they used to be. And uh, those that do come out most commonly are on systems like the 3DS where, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah on, the, on, the, on, on the PS2, stuff. didn't we get seven games out of Atlas in the similar engine in five years or something? Yes, yes, we did. Um, yeah, holy smoke. And it's not like that now. Uh, well, I hope it turns yeah. into that a little bit because I would. I, I would mind, like that. Yes, I, I wouldn't mind a Digital Devil Saga remake that makes the dungeons a little bit more interesting and maybe cuts down some of the grinding. I would actually, I'd really get behind that. I'd also get behind a Switch version of Persona Five. I really want to play this on my Switch. Am I, I the only one? Like, I, I, th- I think when they inevitably do a Golden Fest version of Persona Five, I think a Switch version of that is very logical. I would love this on Switch. I, I, I've i really kind of leaned into more portable gaming. I've talked about that before on the show. And there's something about, like, I think if the Switch... If I wasn't playing Zelda on the Switch, I don't think I would have finished it. But, like, the ability to walk around the house and, like, go upstairs and play it a little bit or bring it to the office when I had a free period or something, that helped me finish Zelda. And, and it was kind of... It was. I almost felt shackled, which brings us back to like the first piece of pr- promotional art for Persona Five of like Lots of emancipation. Yeah, like I, I kind of felt shackled having to play it on my console again. Like I love my PlayStation Four. Don't get me wrong, but the Switch is very appealing for that portability. So uh, yes, please, when Persona Five Red Light District comes out, uh, please put it on <laughs> the Switch, please. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about the localization a little bit. Uh, so if you, if, if, if listeners, you don't want to hear us talking about it again, I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to hit any spoilers here, but I am going to put a tag here about the localization. Um, it's not terrible. And it's one of those, it's one of those things where I wasn't really noticing some of the, the garbled or stilted dialogue until it was brought to my attention and I kind of slowed down. I think the human brain can interpret things very quickly and I'm, I'm used to reading very bad, you know, original, uh, sub, uh, Evangelion from like the 1990s. And so I wasn't really noticing anything. And then when I started reading it slowly, I was like, Ooh, Ooh, some of the E. Right, because it's it. The script is perfectly intelligible, and I'm sure yes. we'll get more in depth into this. But like, at no point in the game do you think, "What's going on? I don't understand what they meant. Where do I go?" There's none of that. It's just there. There know, was not to interrupt, I'll but to the, do my best to accept there are some expectations of me. Messed up. <laughs> the, there was one moment in the game, and I guess this is the only thing that's kind of spoilery, but um. The whole exchange between Kamoshida and Ryuji about Ryuji's leg. That, right. That confused the living hell out of me. I was like, wait a minute. There, the, it, the way it was presented was, I, you know, Kamoshida saying, I broke your leg once already. 
And it was like everybody was talking about it like it was common knowledge, and I felt like I had missed a page of dialogue. And maybe I did. Maybe I was reading too fast, or maybe I zoned out at one point. No, but it, it didn't. To be the reveal. No, yeah. It, it didn't feel like they were. It, it wasn't like the you know. Remember when I did this? It kind of just came across like it was common knowledge, and like the main character didn't really have any like. Whoa, wait, what? Who? Huh? Wait, what? Like. And maybe that was the I, – I can't tell if that was a problem with the original Japanese script or if that was a problem with the localization. But something felt re- – I actually like paused the game, went into the log. Thank you for including a dialogue log in this game. That is awesome, and more games need to do that. And I went all the way back to the top of the screen, read through it all again, and I'm like, no, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about right now. Like now, now I wonder if maybe the original line was something like, you know, like clipping his wings or because, you know – he 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 disbands the team and doesn't allow him to run anymore. Right. So maybe it's more metaphorical because like that didn't really come up again. And then like hours well, and it, hours later, yeah, it comes like, it comes hey, up I again. Kamashita, and I was like, what? No, what? When? Yeah, yeah. I was what? <laughs> yeah, it felt like that. There's there's a real missing or something in that in that dialogue. But and I didn't totally get what happened until I was well into Ryuji's social link or or confidant link, and. uh the the whole localization feels like a you know feels unprofessional like like it could have used additional passes or something because it doesn't it's not it's not that it's inaccurate or that it's leaving out information it's just no one speaks English this way yeah and uh, and it's remi- a lot of lines that need to be reworked yeah yeah and and it reminds me of you know uh, a you know volunteer manga scanlation group that I of of which I I read maybe a little too much. So I so I was able to understand what was happening, but it just didn't feel natural or 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 uh yeah, it just didn't feel natural. And a lot of this comes from overuse of Japanese stock phrases that are translated, yeah. you know, word for word because well as is, as expected of blank. Yeah, as expected, it would be problematic if that happened. It can't be helped. Yes, this it would be problematic cuz like for problematic they're using a verb komadimasu which means like to be problematic, but nobody mm. in English I mean, like, it's grammatically correct to say that, but nobody says it. Mm-hmm. So, while a lot of these constructions are using... Oh my god, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these constructions are, are, are things that, that are intelligible, but they just come across awkwardly or unnaturally, and that's... This food is problematic. That's where the, uh, you know, the localization sort of falls short, you know? It's... And- it's also not in so much because not every line of dialogue in the game has uh, voice work. It feels like the voice work is better. Like most of the scenes, except for Sa, uh, what, what's her name? S A E Sai. Yeah, okay. her dialogue is atrocious in the flashback scenes. Like there, there are times where I'm like, "Are, are you coherent? Did I get concussed? Like what's?" Uh, but most of the spoken dialogue is better i feel like it's mostly around the the non-vocalized dialogue like when somebody's talking to the principal or some of the the shadow stuff and the mementos those moments feel like the real like oh i oh dear like this really doesn't feel good the shadow stuff is a lot of nonsense but I'm, i'm a little more forgiving of that because the shed like the negotiation dialogue in all of these games is kind of nonsense yeah 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 and again, it's not that it's it, it's not terrible. It's just that it does feel a little weak, and I I don't think any of us can say that about Persona Three or Persona Four. Like those games had so much characterization, and everything felt so consistent. This does feel like a little bit of a step back. Well, I'm I'm not sure about Persona Three, but Persona Four was largely the handiwork of Nick Maragos, who's now with um, Treehouse. So. Mm-hmm. I think that his, yes. his deft touch is no longer there. That right. may be and, and maybe a reason. It, it, yes, and it should be said, I think, that I don't think anybody here, or, or lar- most of the people uh, who are online criticizing the localization as well, intend any of this to be personal attacks against any of the members on the localization no, staff. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Because it has nothing to do with them as people, and it what it, what it has to do with more is how that large team didn't mesh properly. And I think that there was a lack of direction here. And mm-hmm. some of the, the creative choices were off the mark, especially with the pronunciation of a lot of the Japanese names. Um, considering some names are pronounced correctly and some aren't, it's kind of like, you know, who did they get their direction from? Because a, a native Japanese speaker would not tell them to say Sakamoto. 
Right. And I, I, I think there's also maybe a little bit of, uh, we got this game relatively quickly. I mean, if we go back to the original days of localization, going Japanese to English and how it would take upwards of a year to get something, and they obviously don't have the money of a Final Fantasy 15 like to release it day and date across the world. I, I feel like there was maybe a little bit of a push to get this out the door because the fans were, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we were all being bastards. Delayed, yeah. We wanted this game as quickly as humanly possible, and I think... Right. You know, come hell or high water, they got it to us. And it was just, it, it was kind of jarring to me to go from, uh, Yakuza Zero, which feels like it has such a, a lovingly it's crafted. So yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, it, there are problems with that game. And it, it is, as Derek said in the last episode, it is a lot of old, old Japanese dudes talking and sighing at each other that can get a little, <laughs> but the, the localization is beautiful in a lot of ways. And I just don't feel like this game has that same thing. And Derek's right. We're not doing personal attacks. We're just, we're calling it like we see it. And I think that localization, we're, we're past the days of IR6 in, you know, Final Fantasy VII or just completely garbled English, and there's none of that in this game, but it just, it feels more functional than stylish, which is so opposed to the rest of this game, which is such a stylish creation. That's very well put. Thank you. I, I can be diplomatic when I try. <laughs> I still love this game. I just, you know, when they, when they eventually do a re-release of this game, I would just kind of hope that maybe with a little bit more time and care, they could re- retranslate it. 120 hours. <laughs> I kind of wonder if, um, because you know, we do live in in the day of of patching and games being updated post release. I wonder if the conversation sort of becomes loud enough, and there and those concerns are heard by Alice. I, I do wonder if they'd consider ever patching some of the dialogue in the game because yeah. it's not. It's not impossible that they could do it. It would be a huge undertaking, and I don't know that it would be, you know, financially super smart of them to do, but it's possible they could. Yeah, and and there's also you got to remember, uh, everybody take a drink. I'm gonna I'm gonna reference Metal Gear. Uh, re- remember that they used almost the exact same script for Metal Gear Solid and Twin Snakes, uh, the GameCube remake, and I think everybody pretty much agrees that the Twin Snakes is is far inferior in delivery. Like, so there is. The, you yeah. can have the lines all correct, but if the direction is off, I mean, there are just moments in Twin Snakes where I'm like, wow, that sounds horrible. You go back and replay the original Metal Gear Solid, and it's like, oh, no, they, they said the same lines. It just did not come yeah. out nearly as well. No yeah, Jeremy because... Blaustein with, uh, with Twin Snakes, is there? No, he was not involved in that one, and well. it, it, it really hurts it in play. I mean, I, I still think Metal Gear Solid is one of the best pieces of localization ever because it's sound. There's very, there's a couple moments that are are the the straight literal Japanese to English, and Jeremy Blaustein even said like we tried to talk to Kojima out of it. Like nobody says "Love Bloom" on a battlefield. Like nobody says that in America. Why are you doing this? But for the most part, that game sounds like a you know Michael Bay action movie, and it's also the best performance out of Dave. David Hayter they ever got. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. And I, I really love these characters in Persona 5, but I do feel like some of their some of their personality feels shaved off, if that makes sense. Like they Yeah. They're they're not as out they, they, well, and maybe that's also part of the nature of this game being a little bit more adult. You know, it, it is hard as a non Japanese speaker to to really come to terms with that, whereas the the cast of Persona Four was bigger than life in so many ways. And I think Persona 5 is a little bit darker, a little bit more mature. They're definitely dealing with more mature scenes. I mean, they're maybe they are supposed to feel a little bit more sedated, but I can't tell if that was a localization problem or not. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of characterization in general, um, again, remaining spoiler-free, uh, Haru, I think, is introduced too late in the game. Yeah. I just think that she isn't developed enough uh, as a character. I mean, she's fine. She's still likable. But, uh, you know, when you have a character joining at hour 60 of uh, an 80 to 90 to 100 hour RPG, it's, it's kind of hard to become as attached and to see as much of them shine through. And, and even, and even, um, with late joining characters in Persona 3 and 4, I'm the last character to join in Persona 3 is Shinjiro, and in 4 it's Naoto. You see them in the plot and in yes. foreshadowing as early as, you know, spring or early summer, but with Haro, yeah. you don't you don't see hide nor hair of her until yeah, you, may, maybe... You see a, her in a couple of cutscenes, like a couple of animated cutscenes. She's in the background, or they focus on her for a second, it. but she but, doesn't interact yeah. in any way. Yeah, but it, but that's that's still, like just before her story segment begins. It's it's way too late. 
it yeah. makes me wonder, you know, whenever I, I, I liked using her and I liked her, but I was thinking like, really, why are you here? I mean, really just yeah. to drive one plot point. And then, yeah. mm-hmm. um, the way that she reacted to it afterwards felt a little false. And, uh-huh. you know, as you, as you said, she, she, she appears so late and her social, li- her, her confidant link appears so late and it's gated quite high to a certain Yeah. Spot. Yeah. I it's got that to two. So, <laughs> I, I managed, yeah, I managed so, to max hers, but I had to make her prior, priority one for, like, the last six weeks of the game. You just neglected yeah. everyone, but you just hung out with her all the time? No, well, not yeah, every, not she, everyone, but many people. She comes <laughs> super late, and you have to have, like, is it rank four or five uh, proficiency? You need rank five per- proficiency to, yeah, to, get it above, to get it above rank one. So you, you can yeah. start it, but if to, to do rank two, you need max proficiency, which, is, tri- which is tricky to raise, like... It, it's really easy to raise um, knowledge and charm, but the other three you have to go out of, out of your way a little bit. Yeah, and not to mention all of her abilities in battle, like baton pass and uh, protect and everything, are all gated yeah. behind that. So it's yeah. like if you don't do her social link, she's kind of not worth using in battle. So yeah, anyway, this isn't a comment on the localization at all. <laughs> yeah, for the for the fifth and sixth palaces, she was my only maiden character that didn't have baton pass, which was annoying and made me want to not use her. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, so, shall we move on from that point to the other thing you'd like to discuss? Yeah, so on? here here's your other break point right here. Um okay, so so for new time listeners, um uh, you you probably don't know that I am a teacher. Uh take my job very seriously. I work at a boarding school. Um you can uh oh boy. Uh you can as the male protagonist in this game uh date older women. And um man does it skeeve me out. Like it just it ah and, and this is a minefield. Uh, Derek and I talked about this briefly through text the other day. Th- this is a minefield. No matter how you slice it, like any opinion that you have on this subject matter can just blow up in your face. So you know, I, I want this to be an area mm-hmm. where we can have a discussion. And I, you know, we got we got a bunch of dudes here, which kind of sucks. I wish we had a female perspective. I'm mad at you, Caitlin, for not being on this episode. How dare you, you, damn it! Uh, but like. I don't know. How do you guys feel about this? Because I'm, I'm sitting here, and it feels like for the first palace in this game about sexual abuses of a male teacher on female students, and then to flip it all around and basically have the the male character, the male protagonist of this game, the underage minor, having all the all this power, and particularly with his homeroom teacher, sort of taking advantage of her in a in not so great place. I mean, I, I guess with uh, what is it? Takami, uh, the the doctor, you could argue that there there's a little bit more of a power dynamic that she is a a more fully formed woman, like not in need mm. of saving. So maybe that one doesn't skeeve me out as much, but the homeroom teacher one just feels right out as Monty Python and everyone would say, like it's just yeah, yeah. And, and, part, and part of it is, I mean, this is also a spoiler, but I guess you uh, you a fair warning, is that your teacher, her story arc is that she works part-time at a maid service. And when you interact with her in her confidant, she Ooh. calls you she calls you master, and she will and she cleans your room and, and, and makes you coffee and can do tasks for you. And that flips the power dynamic of teacher student into servant master in a way that is really creepy. It, it, it's not always, you know, mm. natural and, under, and understandable. And I, I guess it's it's sort of uh, conflating two male fantasies of, you know, romancing a maid and romancing a, a teacher. But it it's not done gracefully. It's like a comedy take on Rule of Rose or something. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, man. It just... Uh, that, I, I feel know. like that relationship had so much potential to explore, yeah. like, this really interesting power dynamic. And... And, she's, and she's an interesting character on her own in a vacuum. Mm. Yeah, it, there's a little bit of the, uh, you know, whenever you read about any of these kinds of cases online and in in the events that it is a female uh, teacher t- uh, um, engaging in sexual acts with a with a minor and uh, and a male, you always have the really like gross response of, oh man, where was this teacher when I was in high school? Like just really gross responses like that, and I feel like this is almost playing into that a little bit, but at the it's, same, oh definitely. What's what's the age of consent in Japan? I, well, I don't. It 13. depends on the prefecture. Uh, yeah, okay. it's not thirteen is everywhere. the official. Uh, yeah, the, like, oh my. Age white age of consent, but also mm-hmm. there's like um, obscenity statuses or corruption of minors, uh, sort of like guide bylines guidelines that raise the actual age of consent to like sixteen to eighteen. 
depending. Yeah. So, so the, the relationship... Also, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, and Persona 5 isn't necessarily um, violating a law. It's just kind of like morally questionable. Right. Um, and I of think course there this... are laws against high school teachers cavorting with students. Though. Oh, okay. Right. I, I know. Yeah, about... I'm not educated enough on that, so I, I could actually be wrong here. So I apologize if I am. A friend um, of mine from the uh, from the UK is a teacher, and we we've talked about this, and they actually have laws in the UK where um, even if the student has graduated. And then they develop a relationship, the teacher and the student. They can actually uh, get you for, uh, I believe it's so-called grooming laws. Like you were grooming this person, you know, as an underage mm-hmm. minor to engage Weird. in sexual acts. Like, so mm-hmm. they can retroactively, like kind of yeah, they, they can retroactively go after you. But it just, again, I, I think with the, you know, I'm sticking my toe maybe on a landmine here. I feel like with the doctor confidant link, both characters are in some form of power. You know what I mean? Like, it it feels like they're both in a good place. She recognizes what she's doing is wrong, but at the same time, he's not in a authoritative uh, authoritative role over her. It's really the the homeroom teacher one that feels, and it feels doubly bad because she's your teacher. You know, this isn't somebody that you didn't have any connection with or anything like that that's outside of your your school life. Mm -hmm. This is your homeroom teacher. Like that, I don't know. It just, it really, ah, yikes. And, yeah, and, and maybe, and maybe worst of all is that her link gives you a lot of good bonuses. So yeah, I was, it's like the best yeah. link. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was, I was extra motivated to do it, even though I was not always totally comfortable with the content of it. The, the trouble here is like, it's, I think it's easy for these kinds of concerns to come off as being sex negative because I am not sex negative at all. It's just, I'm, I'm in fact extremely sex positive. It's just sort of like, you know, we're talking about, it's mostly power dynamic here that makes it kind it's of context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's context. Thank you. I mean, context matters. And the reason why we're bringing this up is just, is not because we want to be like, Ooh, shame on them. It's so nasty. Like you're nasty if you like it, which it, I guess it's easy to come off that way. I just think that we're, we're concerned and we want to discuss like, I don't know. in in a game that's all about sort of, uh, breaking free from oppressive shackles in general and making people not be assholes. Like it's kind of strange that there's a relationship that, that goes so almost like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, so obviously against the first problem presented in the game, like the first arc is about sexual abuse (laughs) and then they, they have this. So it's like, is this not retreading similar ground, but with the flip script? The script yeah. flipped? Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of casting the women as the victim with the with the older male teacher, and then you could make the argument that the main character is victimizing the, the homeroom teacher. It's just... Oh, boy. Uh, it, it's it's really tough to talk about. It, it is, but it just, you know... Uh, and, and I am I, I am going to throw a little bit of a flag on the play here. You know that there was a lot of complaining. We've we talked on this podcast before about a lot of complaining about you know The Witcher and its depiction of women and how like a lot of the monsters that you fight are are women in sexual roles. And I think there's a very interesting conversation to be had there. But it kind of feels like maybe maybe because this is a hundred hour RPG and people are just starting to get to this stuff, it kind of feels like the the Persona Five thing is kind of not being analyzed at the same time. And I just, you know, you, you guys can agree with me or disagree with me on this. I think that we're, we're kind of seeing something here where it's like, you know, the, the localization, some people are telling us to, ah, it's not really that bad. You're, you're maybe getting all worked up over nothing. And then with these confidant links, it's kind of like, oh, come on, it's not really that big a deal. I think it is kind of getting into that territory of, well, because we like it, we're not going to criticize it. And I, I made that argument a couple weeks ago with Zelda. Mm-hmm. Like, I do think that sometimes gamers are not willing to criticize something that they like. And I'm not saying you guys. Like, you know, I love you guys, especially Derek. But, like, I'm, I'm not saying mm-hmm. that about you guys. I just do think that sometimes, you know, and I could be accused of that when it came to The Witcher. I'm sure somebody could say, well, you came to The Witcher's defense pretty hard. And, yeah, you're probably right about that, but maybe I didn't see the same things. I just I, – I feel like there's a really well, good analysis to be had here, and maybe maybe we're just starting it. I, I think much like Zelda, this is something that has been eagerly awaited and a long time coming. So maybe people are just basking in that now and the more yeah. in depth. I mean, it's super good, you guys. Like, oh, yeah. Absolutely. This great. game is 
amazing. It's outstanding. Yeah. But I think there, in general, there is a danger in refusal to critique. I mean, right. we mm-hmm. got we to gotta be able to talk about stuff. And you also can't, like, if you, if you like it in spite of all of that, fine, awesome. I like it in spite of all of that. Like, none of those things made the game bad. It's just, like, if you're not willing to even discuss it, then I think that there's, there's a problem there. And if you're... I, I, because I, what do you gain from, like, blind loyalty or sort of like a blind insistence on there's nothing wrong with it at all. Like it can, there can be these things wrong with it. And I would personally, I would still score this game like a 98 or a 90, 96 or something like it's still outstanding. Right. But I think it's sort of our duty as people who discuss video games in a semi-professional context to critique what may or may not be perfect about the game or what is perfect. You know, we just, we're talking about it. What was yeah. that? Jap- what was that Japanese verb for problematic again? I I also feel uh, very similar to uh, P5, the the P team's uh, last game, which was Catherine, where I really felt that game started off strong by asking some really, really hard hitting questions about relationships and infidelity and, you know, about, you know, guys wanting to kind of go back to being not stepping up to be, you know, men. And then it turns out it's all a demon, and it kind of like it, it kind of flew off the rails at that point. And it's like, oh, I think you guys had something very interesting to say here, but then you just relied on, ah, eh, it's a succubus, screw it, you need to kill it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it just, I, I think this is a team that readily wants to go to these places, and maybe, maybe they're still, you know, dipping their toe into the water. Maybe they're still playing around with it, and we're we're only going to get better by doing more of this if that makes sense like we're gonna we're gonna stumble we're gonna have problems we're gonna have you know problematic trans characters in bioware games we're like uh ah, nah, you got i get what you guys were going oh. for but you kind of screwed it up a little bit but speaking yeah, of Catherine, <laughs> comedy slide whistle if you sleep all. with a trans woman it's to be laughed at yeah and also I'm, I'm a little puzzled by that whole trans woman in mass effect uh, andromeda thing because they had a what I thought was a, a pretty interesting and more positively portrayed trans character in Dragon Age Inquisition. And yeah. so how, how did yeah. they take so many steps back with the, that character in Mass Effect Andromeda? I think it's just it's, different team and, I, I mean, I different direction, all that. But, I mean, we've talked about Mass Effect Andromeda enough. And yeah. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> I, I get that we're uh, particularly, I know... The, those of us here are very invested in critiquing these kinds of social issues, but um, I, you know, I don't want it to sound like, oh my god, games are a chore, and I have to pick apart every little thing that's wrong with it. It's just like, you know, it's worth discussing. These are real things that affect real people, and when you're represented consistently in a way that's damaging on a wider scale, like maybe we should talk about why that's happening in video games. So. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I like video games, you guys. I like to play them on my PlayStation. I like to play them on my Switch, uh, computer, DS. They're Switch is really good. I really like. I the love Switch. the damn Switch. I like, love it. Did I think I already said this that now I'm I'm questioning: Do I go PS4 for trophies or do I go Switch for versatility? Uh, I, I I switched. Ha ha! I made a pun uh, and I didn't even yeah. realize it. I switched my uh, Bloodstain pre-order to uh, the Switch. Nice. Oh. I just realized I really wanted to play it on that device, and I, I will probably be getting Puyo Puyo Tetris, so uh, oh so God, Jackie so can, addictive. yeah, so Jackie can kick my ass at that, and I think we already pre-ordered uh, Mario Kart. Um, I really I like the probably, Switch. I played probably like a a total of uh, like eight to ten hours of Puyo Puyo over the last two days, just um, the demo. <laughs> with people in my house. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's outrageously addictive. I Can't really, die. I think the Switch is a great device, and please put Persona on it, and uh, whatever Shin Megami Tensei Five, if whatever Apocalypse If uh, comes out, I will play it on the Switch. And I think we all like Persona Five. I, I want to get yep. back to that. I, I think we all love Persona Five. It's just that this mm. is such a deep game with, which is handling some very heavy themes. And the places where it excels, we're going to be real positive on. I think I think it's a uh, depiction of the the amount of uh, emotional damage that can be done to a young person placed in that kind of um, character taking advantage of them sexually. I think that 
the game handles that very, very well. Ooh. And then there are, you know, the, the two uh, kind of token gay characters that are maybe not handled so well. So it's like, you, you guys got some things right, and you got some things wrong, and that's the only way we get better at these things, is to kind of analyze, this is good and this is bad. I've yeah. got some issues with how they handled some of the heavier themes. Um, you know, particularly the, the girl who was abused in the first chapter. Um, you know, everything comes to a boiling, a boiling head and then, uh, and she's never seen again. You know, it kind of felt like a, a woman in, a woman in the refrigerator moment. Yeah, she, to me. she, yeah. she shows up in one character's conference yeah, link much later, but yeah, it's, but that's not yeah, yeah, that it's, it's, it's barely a cameo. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as somebody who has, you know, uh, when there when there are problems with young people, sometimes you don't see uh, the end of their story, which really sucks. Like that is, but that is a reality. But I, I get your point with that too, Robert. I it's think that that is like forgotten. Yeah, yeah. I, I think part of it is in um, comparing it to Persona Four. In the dungeons in Persona Four, you have uh, you're rescuing characters, and they typically, and most of them join your party after being after you complete their dungeon and they're rescued. So uh, your individual character development is attached to their introduction, then their dungeon, then their social link, and then their role in the rest of the plot. But in Persona 5, they focus more on the villains than on than on the victims. So yeah, you yeah. They, they do an excellent job of of talking of convincing you to hate the villains that you're about to challenge. Like because I mean all of them are real buttheads and you're and I was eager to bring them to justice basically every time. But as a result, you have situations like uh, like Haru feeling undeveloped because she, I mean, the uh, even her arc didn't necessarily re- revolve around her as much as it revolved around the uh, the culprit you were chasing in that palace. So mm-hmm. I, so as a result, I think I may be a little less attached to Persona 5's cast than Persona 4's. But again, it's because they they chose different um different targets to focus the narrative on. And and they accomplished their goals of making you really hate these villains, which I appreciate, I guess. There's a lot to Persona 5. This thing's awesome. Do we kind of hope that they take a break with Persona after this? I'd be okay with them taking a break for a while. Depends um, on what to take a break from what like uh, well, spinoff games. Uh, I, I guess well, I would I, less spinoffs. I, well, I, I hate to tell you guys. I, I want less yeah. spinoffs. Yeah. <laughs> They they announced um they, well, okay Atlas registered ten domain domain names related to Persona, three of them were Persona Great. eight, three of them were Persona eight, Persona nine, and Persona ten, which they probably just need to squat on, but the other seven were uh, P three D, P five A G, P five D, P five R, P five U, Persona Dance, and P Q two. So there's I think that we're gonna yeah. get. Uh, maybe maybe even a Persona 4 level of saturation over the next couple of years. No! I think I think I think it's I think they know they have a golden goose on their hands and they're gonna keep. All right, I can do it. it until Let's it's do. Dead. I mean, like, huh? I think that uh, the the biggest problem for me with these is that um, while all of those spinoffs like Persona 4 Arena and um, Persona 4 Dancing and even Persona Q are fun on a mechanical level. I hate what they did to the characters and all of them and the, the, the canon, yeah. I guess, the plot lines. I just felt like, especially Persona 4 Dancing and Persona Q. Yeah, just... it, I actually liked Persona Q a lot, but it was almost entirely from a mechanical perspective and to just see the, those familiar names on the screen again because all of the dialogue and character work in that game is awful. And uh, yeah. and I liked the mm. I even liked the Persona 3 character redesigns in Persona 4 Arena, but the thing is, it, it was so much Persona 4 and 3 over those, say, five years from 2012 uh, to 2016 that it looks like they're, they may even be doubling down and going harder at Persona 5 since they know they have something successful on their hands. Well, this is yeah. a smart move financially, but oh, not of course. One that I'm looking forward to at all. Yeah, well, those, uh, voice actors are going to get a lot of work over the next couple of years. Well, I think... I, I would just like to see some more adventurous uh, SMT style games, like oh, yeah. uh, may, maybe another Raido Kozunaha. Well, I can't even yeah, pronounce it. Yeah, Yeah, uh, Kuzunoha, a new, a new like, Devil Summoner. That'd be cool. I didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, oh, it's Devil Survivor is the one I didn't like. I, I really tried to like yeah. Devil Survivor. That game's just way too slow for me. Like that. Mm, maybe I'll try Devil Survivor too. I, like on, honestly, my favorite non Persona. Atlas game is uh, di- is a Digital Devil Saga. So if they made a new RPG that was just like that a little, 
sort of that that yeah. you know that toes the line between your character driven persona and your demon collecting SMT. I I like that so much. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I the should, only, I the only place you, the only place you could take people on a date would just be the desert. Like that was just like you want to go to this sand dune or you want to go to this sand dune or like this top old m- this monument. Over here. Yeah, <laughs> guys, we literally live in a junkyard. What junk do you like the best? On the battlefield. That's one of the things I'm most <laughs> excited about with uh, with SMT is that because Persona 5's dungeons have just way set the bar for what I'm looking for. Like, yeah, holy just, crap! They they just they. They, Crap, are they, good? they annihilate the dungeons in Persona 3 and 4. It's not and, even close. And now I want to see them do that. Like you could do that with Digital Devil Saga and make because that was my thing about that game. When I even when I started to get into the first one, I really hated the dungeons. Like they're just flat, boring. Like again, maybe they get better, but like I was. They really do get out. better, but they're still they they still just have too many random encounters and can be grueling but they're they do get better in that game i don't yeah. i don't want to i don't want to hate on that game which i like I, a lot i think they they've got a formula now with like uh, maybe some of the more openness of the of shin megami tensei 4 on 3ds that that real open like not open world but more open non-linear design and now with this dungeon design for persona 5 mm-hmm. you could put something really really hot together like i guess it takes a lot more work they're so intricately designed but i mean yeah they, they are wonderful. I mean, I, I really love how Persona 5's dungeons, they've, you know, they, you know, they replace a teleporter maze with adventure game elements. And, you know, yeah. more of that, please. Yeah, less, less apocalypse, more this, please. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so let's move away from Persona 5. Uh, we got a couple quick hits here. Um, Mike, you've been playing uh, Cosmic Star Heroin, a.k.a. Why the... I almost swore. I, I stopped myself. <laughs> why, in, why in the world... Uh, it, isn't Sega making more Fantasy Star? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I am playing Cosmic Star Heroin. It's a game I gave to on Kickstarter, goodness gracious, maybe five years ago now, and it's finally coming out. Um, and it's I, I like it a lot. It's an, a 16-bit styled RPG that uh, has a espionage slash sci-fi setting that will immediately evoke Fantasy Star. And there's just a lot of the characters are diverse and fun. The music is awesome. It's it's immediate. It's immediately. I, I, I'm I'm blown away by all the good RPG music we're getting this year. Between Near and Persona and Cosmic Star, I, I'm just I already have like my my music of the year list written, and it's April. But uh, there's, it's very stylish and fun. The combat moves quickly. Doesn't have a MP SP TP system with instead all of your abilities can be used and then reloaded by defending. And uh, and it has a uh, it has a visible um, character turn list similar to fi- to a Final Fantasy X or a Grandia that has you you know manipulate turn position. So it's just a very a very cool visually and orally game that has a uh, that has a lot of neat things going on in combat and navigation. And I've I've only put in a couple hours because I've been just my t- my gaming time has been dominated by Persona Five. But it's this is a it's a very cool game that's on PS4 and PC right now and is coming to other systems later soon. I like how Sega CD the cutscenes look. Yeah, yeah. I love the that. Uh, the soundtrack for the game is outstanding. It's by Hyperdex Soundworks, and yes. this, this developer Zaboy Games previously partnered with them for the soundtracks for um, I think it was just Penny Arcade on the Rings like Precipice of Darkness. Four? Yeah, they right. only did uh, Hyperduct did four, and they did the extra content in three, like the DLC for three. Okay. Did uh, Hyperduct also do Dust and Elysian Tale? Oh, yes, they did. They, they, okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's two it's two Irish guys that we interviewed a couple years ago on an episode of Rhythm Encounter, and mm-hmm. uh, and their work is excellent. I cannot recommend the Cosmic Star Heroin soundtrack. S- mm-hmm. Soundtrack is fantastic. Uh, so I the switch. I don't know. Uh, maybe, un- awesome. Unclear. <laughs> Yeah, it's coming to Vita soon, and I think it's coming to Xbox One at an undisclosed date. Oh, but they, yes. but they, but they start their their partnership was with Sony originally, so it was gonna it was gonna be first day PS4 to begin okay. with. Okay, mm-hmm. I I, I, um, I I go ahead, Robert. I was just gonna, I haven't heard any of the soundtrack yet. Is it like a chiptune style or? It's chip it's um chiptunes influenced, but it definitely goes beyond what's capable in 16 bits. Okay. And I, I would recommend just doing a, a YouTube okay. safari of that music, because and then and then by pretty guitar heavy. Yeah, it uh. is. It's they were influenced. They said by like uh, 
Um, ah, so Red Book audio. Yeah, like, like the uh, <laughs> like the sa- like the soundtrack to '80s sci-fi movies. It's a little Blade Runner. Um, and uh, and and like parts of it remind me to remind me of like my favorite Mega Man X music. It's it's really really good. I encourage I encourage checking it out. Yeah, I need to actually play the game. Uh, thanks to Solosi, uh, I am more interested than I have ever been. So. I, uh, yeah, but, but again, I gave a lot of money to the Kickstarter. I'm not reviewing it for the website because I'm too attached to the project. I've been a, a cheerleader of this game for a, for a while, and I'm overjoyed it's finally coming out, and disappointed that I'm extremely distracted by Persona 5 at the same time. I, I would play that game on the Vita, but I am now like... Uh, I, so Salt and Sanctuary came out on the Vita, and wow, that is not a good version of that game. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I know they were having trouble optimizing uh, Cosmic Star Heroin for Vita 2, so what what kind of problems are it, present it, in that? Uh, at least in the opening areas of the game, it it's not even frame rate, it's slowdown. So it feels like you're playing an old-school NES game when too much is happening on the screen and, like, Mega Man is jumping at half speed. The whole game can feel like that, and it's just – it's a real shame. I was really looking forward to Salt and Sanctuary on Vita. I, I really got into that game on PS4, and yikes. I, it's just uh, I, I think it's time for people to abandon making games for Vita and just switch over to the Switch because I you're getting a hell of a lot more power and a lot more screen and it's just it, it was a real bummer and and maybe it's just the opening areas of the game and once you push through a couple hours it's going to be okay but there there are just parts of that that feel like you're running through mud and it's it's a real shame when you're playing a game that is. It, it, that game has a high barrier, and you need to be moving very fast, and it needs to be very responsive. And the moments where where that's not kind of suck. So remember, Hyper Light Drifter got canceled for the Vita. Um, right. Yeah. It, it, it's it, the uh, Vita's a the, great and system. The as well. Yeah, the Vita's a great system, but it is apparently a bear to develop for. Yeah, and, the, the Cosmic Star Heroin guys specifically mentioned that they wouldn't have been able to do the Vita. If they had if they had waited late to start, but they were from almost the beginning, they were developing the game in Unity, w- intending to eventually have it on the Vita. So they they started the the, uh, the you know transposition process early. And I also should mention it: the PS4 and Vita for Cosmic Star Heroin is cross by. So if you buy the PS4 version, once the PS version once the PS Vita version is out, you'll also have that in your download list. Yeah, oh, cool. and Salt and Sanctuary is cross by as well. So you, it was just weird because I had played it a year ago on PlayStation Four, so I had to delete it and then re-download it, and then I had the Vita version. But uh, yeah, I, I just if Cosmic Star comes out on the Switch, uh, that will probably be where I play it. Uh, it I got on, weirdly enough, I got on a DS Castlevania kick uh, where I played. I had Portrait of Ruin. And uh, so that was the second DS Castlevania game, uh, the one where you get to switch characters. I really like the fact that it takes place with the uh, the Bloodlines storyline, the one Sega yeah. Genesis. Yeah. Uh, a very underrated uh, Castlevania, that was, in my opinion. That, that was uh, the first Castlevania game that uh, my homegirl, Michi Rumane, worked on. Yeah, and, and it's – unfortunately, Portrait of Ruin is probably the weakest of the DS Castlevania games. No um, way. It's better than Ecclesia by far. No, yeah, I, I, you I are, like – no, You are objectively wrong. I like Ecclesia uh-huh. more than Portrait of Ruin. I, I Ecclesia really, has great ideas, but – Ecclesia doesn't hit every idea, but at least it's – yeah. yeah, that game needed to be two hours longer and have like another page of abilities for Shinoa. But that I, – I, I like that game a lot. I think what's weird is that the the DS Castlevania game started to rely. I, apparently, Ega took it personally when everybody said Harmony of uh, Dissonance and uh, and Aria of Sorrow were easy, and he decided to up the difficulty on those DS games. But it's kind of the wrong kind of difficulty where a lot of the bosses you're just trying not to run into them. Like their best attack yeah. is to just like nudge up against you and take like a quarter of your health bar. And They've got far too much health of their own. Yeah, like you're just – and don't get me wrong. There are a couple bosses in Ecclesia that are like, holy god, like you are just the not fun to – Yeah, the crab can just go to hell. Like that – once you figure out the technique, it's not that bad, but – The, the big – gig, yeah, the gigas at the end of the hallway w- oh. can kill you in two hits in that thing. And I, I remember that one being particularly challenging. But you had to you, you had to have some Mega Man playing reflexes in terms of pattern recognition for those yeah. – for the harder parts of those bosses. There were a couple bosses in Portrait of Ruin that I have like purposefully forgotten about because I was getting 
pretty pissy. Uh, so then I switched over to Dawn of Sorrow. I'm playing through Julius mode on that, which kind of tries to recreate uh, Castlevania 3, except they forgot to bring along Grant Dynasty, the best character in Castlevania history. <laughs> uh, Agreed. And, and I guess I'm kind of I guess I'm kind of playing these because like we have that Netflix series coming out God knows when and I'm I'm excited about that. Yeah, they they um we're getting Castlevania animated series and Carmen San Diego animated series on Netflix later this year, which we is all, awesome. We can, we can only hope they're as good as Captain and the Game Master. Uh, how yeah, do you remember Simon Belmont in that show? Simon <laughs> Belmont, vampire the, hunter with the enormous chin and the pink and the pink frilly outfit. <laughs> I just like good lord. Uh, and so I'm playing those, and I guess I'm also excited for uh, for Bloodstained, which we brought up a little bit ago. Like, the demo for that got me really excited. I guess the two things that I really want out of Bloodstained, one, don't turn it into booby monsters, the game, because they've already shown off one booby monster, and I'm a little... A little bummed about that, Every and also when you gave me one, come on. Uh, yeah, but like, at, uh, okay, just one, like one succubus enemy uh, who, in the original art for Symphony of the Night, just was full blown naked. Like, totally okay with that. There's there's some cosplay in my head. Now Jackie's wearing that cosplay. Naked okay, cosplay. I, I need to get back to this. Um, and and then like, um, I also don't want them to focus on the difficulty. Like, I, I don't, I, I hate that old school game design, like 2D platformers of like, the worst thing an enemy can do to you is touch you. Like, I just, I don't know why. I'm really glad that we've gotten away from that with like modern video game design. But like, imagine a Dark Souls game where you took damage if you rubbed up against something. Well, I mean, yeah, that that, that, that old school design is preserved a little bit in your, in the, uh, you know, the rogue legacies and the, of the world. Yeah, but, a little uh, bit. Um, but uh, again, I don't mind you know modern games softening that a little bit. Like even like I I uh, uh, I played Shovel Knight a year ago and thought it was really really awesome. But sometimes got you know sometimes a bird hit me out of the air and I fell into a pit and then I had flashbacks to Ninja Gaiden on the NES and yep, yep. and I and I wish that wouldn't happen anymore. But I mean it, it's that still is around a little bit. A little bit. I, I I was just really surprised that the Castlevania DS games got hard. Like, they, they legit went from, like, kind of pushovers. Like, Symphony of the Night is just, you could destroy that game. Like, just get the chrysogram and just tear that game apart. <laughs> they made Alucard really powerful in that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate the making them difficult again, but I just, in some ways, I think it's the wrong kind of difficulty. I think it's a little artificial. Like, remember the Shadow Boss in Ecclesia where it's only safe in, like, uh. one thing? <laughs> That's the one I was thinking of when I, yep. I couldn't remember if it was like I a shadow or yeah. no shadow. And it's like right. if you're not standing on this one pixel, he will just kill you. Like oh, so good. obnoxious. <laughs> I should that, play Ecclesia. That game's really hard. That game's really hard. And then uh Mike, can I talk about the other game that I played, or are we supposed to save that for May? Um we've been talking about it on a different podcast. Uh, so, so you, we, we can, br- we can bring it up briefly, sure. Okay, I beat Dragon Quest V. It was amazing. I, I love that game. <sighs> it's, it's so good. Five and eight are my two favorites in the series, and I've played all of them except for ten, which is the, you know, the Japan-only MMO. So I, I have a lot of affection for five. That game's great. If you have a, enough old school tolerance to play at least the beginning of it, then I, I recommend it to any fan of RPGs. Yeah, the, the the beginning was a little tough, uh, mm-hmm. but having your dad come and save your ass every time was pretty pretty damn awesome. Uh, your dad is one of, one of the best NPCs in RPG history. Yeah, he, and then on oh, and we'll we'll talk about it on Retro Encounter, but that game just comes full circle, and it mm-hmm. also the DS. I, I can't speak to the original version of that game, but the DS version only took me like twenty hours, which was the perfect length. Like the that was just versions a, the original version is a little harder since you only get three characters in your party instead of four. But yeah. uh, but otherwise it's pretty much the same and it, it's uh it's not an overlong RPG. I agree. Yeah. I, you think five only took you twenty hours to beat? It's yeah. A huge game. I'm very surprised. It's, it, no, it's it's big, but it, it um if you if you know what you're doing and have played Dragon Quest before, there's a it's it, it's it, it's much shorter than uh six or seven or eight. Yeah, six is supposed to be the long one. Uh, seven is the really long one. Seven, seven, seven's the longest one. I believe seven, seven, the, seven, the word you're looking for, is absurd. Like, yeah. that game is just absurdly long. And then eight on the 3DS was amazing, because by speeding up the battles, it went from yeah. an 80-hour RPG to a 30-hour RPG. 
And then they, uh, and they have, they added more post-game content. I, I, whatever, I love Dragon Quest 8. I don't, we don't need to talk about every yeah. Dragon Quest gate 8, every Dragon Quest game from the 90s on. No, we but, can talk about every Dragon Quest 8. <laughs> well, <laughs> this time. sure. But we are gonna talk very briefly, because I know Derek has to get out of here. We are gonna talk very briefly about Dragon Quest 11. <sighs> right. Oh man. Now, please, give it to me now. Like, it looks so good. I, so this was weird, though. Like, the 8-4 play guys were really down on it. They were like, oh, I don't think it looks as vibrant as Dragon Quest Eight. And I'm like, what are you guys smoking? What? Like, it, it looks amazing. Like, every version that. of that game looks great. We just got a release date for the PS4 and DS versions, which is July 29th in Japan. Yep. And we and we know that the Switch version is coming, but they haven't had they don't have a date for that yet. We don't even know what the Switch version. And looks we don't know like. which it is. Yeah. 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 Correct. Um, and uh, they have a bundle in Japan where you can get both the PlayStation 4 and Nintendo 3DS version. That's which, insane. I love it. Think <laughs> about that for a second. <laughs> I was going to go up anyway. On Dragon but... Quest. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is so wild and also kind of something I want. So And apparently <laughs> there is a way, like they're being real cagey with the language on this and it's again it's coming from probably bad localization and translation, but they're being real cagey about the fact that apparently there is a way to go from one version to the other and at least take some of the saves over like I don't I th- know. I think it's going to be a Dragon Age Inquisition thing. It's uh, weird that I bring that game up twice this podcast, where there, there's like a website you can upload data to, and then uh, like some kind of intermediary. You email them your save file, and then somebody creates a save in the other version with the same <laughs> name, and then they play as fast as they can up to where you were. Wow. <laughs> there's 24 <laughs> mail turnover. You gotta, you gotta, like, you open your instruction manual, and you find that postcard in the middle that you have to tear out. Oh, the other yeah. You, yeah. you just put your name on it, say what other Square Enix games you like, especially Ein Honder, throw a stamp on that, hey. and then do it. Hey! Hey! Hey, you get, hey. First, first you gotta buy the tube TV and the retro game console near the coffee shop. Then yeah. once you, then once you beat the game, they give you a card, oh and, once you, and once you take the card to the guy in Akibahara, he'll give you a special accessory for it. You know, mm-hmm. Mike, you're it's joking. For, for the Game Gear. You, you're joking right now, Mike, but you're gonna buy all three versions of this damn game. <laughs> I don't have a Switch, so I'm gonna, buy, I'm gonna buy two versions of that damn game, and then the third once I have a Switch. I, I'm already, I, I'm buying two versions of uh, Tokyo Xanadu this year too. I'm I might I'm close Maybe to buying two three. versions of that and also two versions of East Eight. Yeah, I am really really. Uh, so what do we think? Do we think it's going to take a year for us to get Dragon Quest Eleven? Uh, I I think 2018, but um, yeah. but but they have been pretty good about getting more Dragon Quest to us recently. So I think I don't think they're going to skip it, but I think 2018. A little yeah, bird tells me it's being well. localized now, but that's all I can say about it. Ah, we're going to talk after this podcast. Oh, that's over. interesting. Dragon Quest 7 and 8 were u- localized in the UK, and Rob Fenner does live in the UK. Mm. So, who can say? so what you're saying is I need to kill Rob Fenner, wear his skin. Okay, I can make this work. <laughs> I, I would say... Well, how did we get there? We have so uh, many Robs here, and now there only can be one. There, there are too many mics and too many Robs on the website. We have to get rid of a few. Uh, I, I'd say probably next year. I, I'd say like March or April of next year. That that oh, would be my that's estimation. That's definitely a next year thing. I, yeah. I think it is, at least. I, I would hope that we get some kind of confirmation at E3 of just like, and it's coming That'd to be the nice. West. Yeah, I would like that. that. Oh, God, it looks so good, guys. Really nice. I've wanted this game since 2000, what, 6? When mm-hmm. Dragon Quest, no, 2005. Yeah, 5 and 8 I, came out. Yes, this one came out. Because, like, I like 9, don't get me wrong, but 9, I, I kind of wish they would go back and remake 9 with sprites, because those DS graphics are butt ugly now. And, like, and also, you, it's kind of hard to go back to 9, since the, the DS's uh, internet network is down, so, yeah, you, so you, you, can't, you can't use any of the, any of the uh, um, Wi-Fi functions in 9, 9 anymore. Yeah, can so you not even play that game co-op now? You probably Off-line can locally. You can. Yeah, locally. Yeah. Oh man, that blows. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't think nine aged very well. I think those three D graphics, yikes, yeah. uh, not they good. Um, um, you know what else comes out this month? Probably, uh, probably like the day this podcast is out is uh, Dragon Quest Heroes two. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, I've been right. playing that for review. I'll have a review on our site shortly. I don't know if it'll be up on release day. Hopefully, that's what I'm shooting for. But, um, is it better than DQ one Heroes? I mean, it's like more or less the same. You know, it's a Muso game is a Muso game is a Muso game, but this is uh, really polished and has some nice additions. Like the two main characters can change vocations, um, and so they can, you can have them be either like 
warrior mage, priest, thief, martial artist. Yeah, those are the five. Yeah, yeah I've, then, wa- I've watched trailers of it in videos, and uh, and it shows that each each main character can use something like eight weapons. Yeah, I think it's. I want to say maybe more than that, but yeah, the the classes sort of affect your stat distribution, and then the weapons all play separately, which is really cool. And um, a, a lot of the move sets I've noticed are just based on past characters. Like I, I put my main character with a whip, and he's just Jessica now. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So it's it's nice to have the versati- vers excuse me the versatility because you have to have at least one of the main characters in your party at all times. So it's like. Now you're no longer stuck if you don't want a sword guy. You can make him whatever the hell you want. And um, generally I find the original characters created for this one to be uh, just cooler, better. I like their designs better. I like playing as them better. Um, the original and, character is the yeah, last like, game kind of put that down. Yeah, I didn't really like those very much. Like the, the boomerang chick and uh, Isla or whatever, and then the king. I just I thought they were meh. So I like these ones a lot better, and uh, I want to say I think all of the characters from DQ Heroes One Return, all of the cameo characters, they uh, they do they they specifically brought that up in the materials for this game. I noticed okay. that. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, and then there's Bringing in Tornico, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Tornico's in it. Um, um Angelo was at, Angelo was added. Uh, Carver slash Hassan from Six is in it. Uh, they they um uh, uh Chiral slash uh the whatever the priest dude from Dragon Quest Four is in it. I really hope that we get a Dragon Quest Builders 2 announcement. I really want that. I don't them to want work. that. No. No, I do. I want them to work on that formula because I, I think they had something really good there that just a couple of tweaks here and there. You didn't like it that the much. Interface changes. No, I think it's I think right. it's fine for what it is. I just think one is enough. But I was just bummed. But Square Enix likes money, so I'm sure they'll. Yeah, make that. I, I was just bummed. Maybe a revised Switch version with better mm-hmm. menus. That and, could be better. Uh, and yeah, Chapter Three. That would be a good place. That'd be a good uh, a good place for it too. So that would be great as a Switch game. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I would just I, I would like that game. There, there's some really cool moments where like you you got the fire bullets and the ice bullets, and I think that they need to do more of that stuff instead of the just walking up and slashing something 50 times until it finally dies. Like that's what they need to. Like, get, get more of the building aspect into the combat, and you might have something really, really special. That that game was really cool. I just, man, Chapter 3 made me not want to play it. I think they did a good job, especially considering, as, as we've discussed before, if you're a Minecraft-averse person like me, I think that having direction does wonders for that style of game. Yes, I just I totally I don't agree. necessarily want another one, but I wouldn't begrudge you for wanting another one. Just want to see some ideas fleshed out a little bit more. That game was charming as hell. Like that was a really cool. Also, more soundtrack. Like the what's in there is beautiful, but there's like 20 minutes. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I gotta game. say, like I'm ready for more Dragon Quest music. Or uh, this may be blasphemous, but I don't necessarily need Koichi Sugiyama to continue doing the music for Dragon Quest. Like I'm, I've right. heard enough. Not man. for much longer at his age. Whoa. Yeah, yeah he's <sighs> he's definitely 90. But I mean, he's old as hell. I have I imported a copy of Dragon of a uh, Dragon Quest Theater Rhythm many many moons ago, and mm-hmm. it's it, it, it it's fun. It doesn't and work. It doesn't it, work as well, I think, as uh, Final Fantasy Theater Rhythm, just because a lot of Dragon Quest music isn't as distinctly melodic, because there's yeah. so many that are just, like, sweeping orchestral pieces that they all blend yeah. together. A, a lot of the field gameplay in that works, because, like, you know, feeling of character ambling along on a journey works for Dragon Quest, but it's, it's not as, like... It, it's it's not as dynamic or diverse as uh, as Final Fantasy music. I think the biggest problem with the Dragon Quest soundtracks when you compare the four sound uh, four disc soundtrack to Persona Five, which is huge, and there's so many different pieces, and there's there's instrumental pieces, and then there's the vocal version. Dragon Quest games just don't seem to have a lot of music, but it's beautiful what's there. But then it's like, wow, I've heard the same track. Yeah. Over and over and over, and it's like if I hear one more time, da 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 da, ba 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 da 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 da. Like how it still feels fresher to me than Sakuraba's soundtrack. Oh God, yeah. Well, everything is like a week old natto sitting in your fridge is fresher than a Sakuraba soundtrack. All of him is like is like replacement level. RPG town music. I, I I have difficulty telling his soundtracks apart. I'm so yeah, sick to He used to about. be good. His stuff at Wolf Team was great. Yeah, he's capable. It's just that I think that his uh, he's limited by his uh, overseers. Yeah. yeah. 
Some more Dragon Quest music. That's what we're looking for. Yes, please. Uh, more soundtrack. Like, don't just give me 12 tracks. I need, like, 30. All right? That's, yes, that's please. Yes. All right. So, uh, good show, guys. Persona 5, I'm going to now go back upstairs and play it because Jackie's gone all day. So. I'm going to go back downstairs and play it. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to for... swivel my chair to the left and play it. There you go. Uh, so, thank you, everybody, for listening to the show. For Derek, Mike, and Robert, we will see you all later. Take your time. Spinny logo, spinny logo, spinny <laughs> logo, spinny logo. Roll the, roll the dice, give in to temptation. I, do, I don't want emancipation. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>